So for those of you just joining us, we're going to keep on chit-chatting here. We're going to actually get going at 105. Um, thank you guys very much for joining us. Excited to have Rafe with us. So um, so you flew up from LA, right? I did. I didn't test loop up here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next time. Next time. Ooh. Yeah. Okay. I like to drink Kool-Aid. Is it, is it just Teslas that they do? Yeah. Uh, as far as I know. Interesting. Yeah. I'm actually really... So Caterpillar, self-driving tractors. Oh, yeah. Why not? So I went to go see this guy in um, the Central Valley. He was apparently on this technology and ag kind of council format sort of thing. And I went in, and here's a guy, baseball cat, big belt buckle, boots. How are you doing? And then we start talking about water conservation, and in, instantly I'm like talking to a quant. Hmm. And he's talking about like how many parts per million and how many acre feet and acre inches they actually use per acre of you know water and the tolerances that they actually use for water. And then they use micro drip, which is buried 18 inches under the ground. And so the water goes directly to the root, so there's no evaporation. And then he gives me a ride in his tractor, which I'm, it's like it's a cockpit. And it's like I'm in the cockpit of an airplane or something. There's two joysticks. There's joysticks. There's no steering wheel. And there's like a heads up display. And you have like a topographical 3D representation of your field. Mm. And you lay down boop, 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 waypoints. And then you hit go. You turn up the tunes and you listen. So the tractor is automated. It goes down. You draw. You turn it around yourself because they don't want to like run over anybody while you're turning it around. And then it comes back. He says that they can actually plow a field and they only double plow one inch. The tolerances on the self-driving tractor are one way and then they overlap by one inch on the way back. And he's like, that way we used to actually have to, you know, go over fields six times to actually do whatever it was that we were doing. Now we can only do it, we can do it in four passes as opposed to six. That's efficiency. And I was just like, oh my God, Caterpillar, it's brilliant. Because they don't got to worry about running into people so much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, well, hey, let's get going here. Um, there's going to be a few more people that are actually... Um, joining us um, as we talk in, but we're coming at you guys live from the 11th story of the old Bank of America building in downtown San Jose, California at Hackers and Founders Global Headquarters, Headquarters, Headquarters. Um, and we're actually doing as part of our investor webinar series, um, we have the very distinct pleasure of having Mr. Rafe first here. Um, Mr. Ray First um, has been, among many things, a computer scientist, a um, avid poker fan, uh, a sometime good golfer. What's your handicap? I thought I'd play. Okay. <laughs> I, I've never, with the ball, if it has not balls and points, I'm terrible at it. <laughs> um, but then you were the founder of crowdfunder.com and co founder, yeah. Co founder, yeah. sorry. Um, and then we were actually in Guadalajara, Mexico at an investor conference together. And um, your prezo, frankly, was one of the most requested, like seconds again. So we said, we've got to have you. So you came up here, not in the test loop, but you flew up here. And they, um, I'll let you take it away. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. So thanks, by the way, thanks for having me up here. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, I've probably been uh, playing poker mm -hmm. a little bit longer, maybe maybe just as so long as I did, I, you know, been programming. Mm -hmm. So it's, uh, you know, passionate, passionate as a hobby, um, and played uh, here in the Bay Area for many years, mm -hmm. um, alongside you know hacking and starting companies, and uh, along the way, I just saw so many parallels between. Uh, not only in investing in mm -hmm. poker, frankly, but also entrepreneurship, mm. right? This idea of uh, going all in, making a big bet mm -hmm. in it, uh, hopes of unusually large returns. Yep. There's a lot of uncertainty and Absolutely. risk. Um, so I guess what I'm going to be talking about here is the parallels between uh, investing, especially venture capital investing, angel mm -hmm. VC investing, especially early stage. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in poker, I'm playing a game of poker. And what I've done is I've mapped out about 10 principles 
where I could give you the talk once and and teach you a bit about poker cool. uh, that will help your game. I'm, I guarantee it, no matter what level you're at. I could give the same talk about uh, VC investing. I think it'll up your game as well. Nice. Um, but I'm going to just combine it into one, and it'll just be, you know, so 10 principles. So Excellent. Do you want to, okay, I guess we're on the screen here. So, cool. And um, we're going to be hearing Rafe live. He's going to be doing his presentation. We do have a live studio audience at the same time. Um, and if you guys have questions, we'll save them towards the end, and you can put them in, in the chat room um, at the end, and we'll take some questions for you. Um, but a um, letter right there. Okay, cool. So here's, here's the key insight. Uh, both poker and investing really are the same games. They're uh, games that make a good financial decisions under conditions of extreme uncertainty and risk, mm -hmm. right? Self-evident once you say it. Yep. Um, and what I'm going to do here is show you uh, some some clips or some video and, and whatnot. Um, this is from a. Um, I, I I'm going to spoil alert. So I won this tournament. This is like the peak of my poker career. I ended up winning this. World Series of Poker Tournament. It's a lifelong dream of every poker player. I won in 2006 in Vegas uh, in front of the cameras. And so really the reason we're here is this is just a setup. I haven't done anything since mm -hmm. in poker uh, to speak of. This is a setup to relive my glory days. So thank you for bearing with me on that. I'm able to learn something about poker. So this is extreme uncertainty and risk. And if you can't hear anything, just uh, shout into the, into the chat box. You can hear it. Good. You can't hear it. Should I risk turning this on? No, that would create feedback. Asking me to narrate. Okay, so um, I won't narrate this per se, but what happened here is I was uh, trying to illustrate the concept of a difference between a decision and an outcome. And especially when you have extreme uncertainty and risk, like in investing or startup yeah. land or in poker, uh, they're not the same thing. And you have to divorce the decision making process a bit from the outcomes in the sense of you can have uh, the expected outcome, good decision leads to good outcome, bad decision leads to bad outcome, but oftentimes you can end up getting lucky or unlucky. Bad decision, good outcome, that's getting lucky, like I did here. The bad decision uh, is that I did what, what was called slow playing my pair of aces, which is the best starting hand, and I allowed the worst starting hand to catch up and become in a dominating position um, because I didn't bet aggressively enough. So that was a bad decision. Um, let's see, Coast asked you to start your video. Start my video? No. Huh, it's weird. Say yes. Okay. Oops. Anyway, so good. All right. So uh, knowing the difference between decisions and outcomes is really important in, uh, in areas of great uncertainty and risk. Okay. So, that's one of the principles, one of the 10 principles. Um, I won't belabor them here, but you can get an overview. And uh, are we good on sound? Yeah, we're good. Okay, cool. All right, so here we go. Uh, the biggest secret in venture capital, famous uh, quote from Peter Thiel in his book, mm -hmm. best investment uh, in the fund equals up for the entire rest of the fund combined. All right. Okay, so decisions and outcomes. Selective aggression. This is really important. So this is the um, this is the most important uh, you know, uh, thing in poker hmm. um, is to be uh, selectively aggressive. I will uh, I will talk about first. I'll I'll talk about the principles as they relate to venture investing because I think that's more common mm -hmm. to everybody here. Um, and then I'll go through them again and mm -hmm. talk about poker concepts. So here's an example, uh, very famous where. Uh, um, 
if you Uber, uh, uh, early investors made 2,000 uh, times their initial outlay. So if you had invested $10,000 in Uber at the seed round, wow. you would have 20 million bucks, okay? This is life-changing kind of decisions. Absolutely. Right? Um, and so, uh, and I think we, uh, let's see. Do we know what valuation that was at? Uh, in terms of the original investment, it was certainly less than 10 yeah. million, right? Yeah, wow. So probably even, even much less. Um, because even Uber, you know, had a tough time to raising money. I'm sure. Mm -hmm. um, we know Airbnb did so yep. a little bit later. So here's an example par excellence in the venture investing world. That you know, Sako is an early investor in Uber, Twitter, Instagram. He is selective about what he bets on, but he's very aggressive. He's very aggressive in terms of uh, trying to get into the rounds. Mm -hmm. He's famously aggressive. Yep. Um, and he buys as much stock as he possibly can. Wow. Right? So selective aggression. He's made over a billion dollars on, I would say, this you know, main trait alone. Wow. So selective aggression is very, very important. We'll talk about that in poker in, in, in a bit. Um, first mover advantage. Hmm. Okay? So we all know about last mover advantage. I'll talk about that in a second. But first mover advantage, uh, sorry, we all know about first mover advantage. Um, what we don't know so much is there's there is really a last mover advantage. First mover advantage is is important in business, um, especially innovation. Uh, for instance, patented technology. Right, if you're going to get a patent on Viagra, you have to be first to market in order to file it. It's a billion dollar first mover advantage. Wow, it's important in winner take all markets, but there has to be a high switching cost. Um, in order to keep the first mover advantage. If there is not high switching costs mm -hmm. in winner take all market, you actually have a last mover advantage. So hmm. that's gonna be uh, even more important in poker. But here is the way to illustrate that. Right? We all know these stories. Friendster, MySpace, Facebook. I don't know if you know anybody here was on Friendster. I was on Friendster. They had the whole market. I think they were at like you know 50 million people or something like that. And overnight they had a technical glitch and MySpace took over. Crappy, crappy interface. It was a you know horrible experience, but MySpace took over, billion dollar uh, acquisition by uh, Fox, and then this fledgling came out of Harvard and the university system, Facebook. So um, the reason why last movers actually have an advantage, first movers have an advantage, mm -hmm. but last movers also have, to have an advantage. Mm -hmm. The last mover advantage um, is last movers have more information mm -hmm. about what their market is and what the competitors do and they let their competitors make mistakes, right? So you can get a free ride on other people's information and what they do. Um, in, in these examples here, Alta Vista, Yahoo, Google, search, right? There's just low switching costs, right? Low switching costs in social networks, low switching costs uh, in, in search, at least there was until recently, now there's such a dominant mm -hmm. lock-in effect. But while those switching costs was low, it was very easy to cannibalize the market overnight, seemingly. Mm -hmm. All right? So last mover advantage, first mover advantage, both are important. Um, all right. Dominating a niche. So how did Google and Facebook get their, uh, their lock-in? They mm -hmm. achieved their lock-in. They didn't do it by serving everyone. Mm -hmm. All right? And uh, Yahoo's a pretty... Uh, poignant example as, as of late, uh, trying to do everything for everyone, whereas Facebook, Google focused on one thing, mm -hmm. and we know this in, in lean startup land, what is your, um, but for many, many years, uh, and it's, it's uh, entrepreneurs really did try to boil the ocean, I'm guilty of this myself, it's tempting to try to serve everybody, right? everybody you think you can, but sometimes the best way to really achieve that lock-in effect, especially if you're the first mover, is just dominate a niche and then branch out, hmm. like Google and Facebook have. How are we doing? Good. Okay. Turn this monitor a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. yeah absolutely. Cool. All right. Are people seeing the uh, the slides? Yeah. Okay. Good. Optionality. This is yep. my, my my favorite. This yep. is. If you guys know uh, who Nassim Taleb is, Nassim mm -hmm. Taleb, he wrote The Black Swan, yep. incredible book, mm -hmm. I recommend it to anybody in innovation. His follow-up is called Anti-Fragile, and it, it really could just be called Optionality, 
Hmm. Um, optionality is where you have limited costs or downside, but unlimited upside, for instance. Or you have, another way of saying it is you have multiple ways to win, mm -hmm. and but again, limited or, or you know, to no downside. Um, so in the world of investing, the instruments that we use in early stage especially, preferred equity, convertible notes, stock options, these are all examples where optionality is built into the investment instrument. Hmm. Um, convertible note, as you know, is a, is a loan with an option to convert, not an obligation to convert, mm -hmm. to equity. Stock options, the option to purchase equity later at the current market price, meaning below market, presumably. Mm -hmm. uh, you won't exercise your stock option unless the difference between the later price and the current price mm -hmm. is big enough. Um, so optionality is an important uh, concept in, uh, in investing, for sure, and also in poker, as you'll see. All right, pulling the trigger. So here's an example um, where actually I didn't pull the trigger. Right? I had all the information to make a good decision. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, if you look at the date of this email, November 2001, remember there was 9-11, for whatever reason, I liked everything about this investment, mm -hmm. and I didn't pull the trigger. Um, and so you gotta, you, you actually have to, um, actually have to make decisions, not knowing, of course, what the outcome is. Um, and so there's a lot of folks, especially in uh, in poker and in angel investing, mm -hmm. who are fantastic analysts. They know how to make the best decisions, mm -hmm. but they don't actually make the decision. They don't actually pull the trigger. Um, so this was what I would say is about a ten million dollar mistake for me, oh. not pulling a trigger. Um, you know, I was, I was uh, given the opportunity to invest at the seed stage. It would have been a, you know, a big, uh, a big uptick. All right, so you got to divorce decisions from outcomes. That was, uh, I would say, a bad decision, and from my perspective, a bad outcome. I didn't get it. <laughs> this idea um, of, you know. Decisions versus outcomes and, and uncertainty is is actually so common among venture investors. One mm -hmm. of the most august firms out there, Bessemer, uh, venture capital firms, actually honors the the ones that they miss, the anti-portfolio. All right, so um, I title this "Hacking Your Emotions." Mm -hmm. It can it can get a little bit mm, frustrating to say the least. <laughs> Um, if you're making uh, good decisions and, and you have bad outcomes, or if you're making bad decisions and you have bad outcomes, it's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> bad outcomes. Um, bad outcomes are bad outcomes. Uh, yeah, can can wreak havoc with your emotions and your ability to make good rational decisions going forward. Mm. Very important in poker. You know, I, I'd say uh, it's it's equally important if you're running a startup or you're investing in a startup. So I use uh, what I what I call the sleep at night test. When I'm investing in an early stage startup, I just imagine, because this is what the numbers show, mm. six months later, the founder says, hey, Rafe, we gave it our best try, blah, 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 it's funny thing happened in the way of the forum. Mm -hmm. We're out of business. I lost your entire investment. Sorry about that. Um, and if I can imagine losing any sleep that night that I learned that the company's out of business six months later, I don't invest or invest a lesser amount, mm -hmm. right? That I feel like, you know what? The odds are eight out of 10, early, like early stage is coming. Maybe, maybe this is changing now, but certainly you're more than 50% to lose your money on a single investment. Mm -hmm. uh, you gotta get comfortable with that emotional roller coaster and, mm -hmm. and really try to get zen about it and, and know that if you make good decisions over a long period of time, you're actually going to earn money. Um, even though it might feel like you're not in the short term. Hmm. All right, so you gotta know the math in order to get comfortable. Uh, here are the numbers, 70,000 startups were funded last year. Wow. Um, most of them by angels, not venture capital firms, but, uh, but nonetheless, these are professional or professional grade investors. Mm -hmm. uh, one in 3,000 of them uh, become unicorns, uh, billion dollar valuation, um, one in a hundred of them, uh, of the VC back one, uh, uh, stars become unicorns. So I'm not necessarily saying that the VCs are, are better at, at picking which ones are going to be unicorns, but 
there's something that goes on in the process of going through seed stage, friends and family seed stage, angel, and then venture. The venture uh, capital firms are set up to uh, either attract or detect or groom um, unicorns, right? These uh, multi-billion dollar exits. So mm. um, just think about that in your investing strategy. If you can get in alongside of top VC and let them do all the work, it might not be a bad strategy. Um, knowing the math. So this is really the key. Diversification is the key. Uh, here is, and this is a little bit complicated, so I'm going to tell you the punchline of this. What this is is if you want to achieve market returns at the seed stage, and that's on the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, um, and in this market, uh, 3x return on capital is, is about the market returns. Pretty darn good. Mm -hmm. It's actually triple what you get in the stock market, public stock market. But in order to have like an 85% certainty of achieving those market returns, you actually have to invest in over 300 startups. Um, if you want a 95% certainty of achieving these market returns, uh, you have to invest in close to 1,000 startups. Now, um, and if you have under 20 investments in your portfolio at the seed stage, you're actually at 50-50 to go broke. Wow. Okay. You're just as likely. So the variance is very high. Mm. We say in the poker world, variance is high. The, the expected outcome or the average, the market average, is still very high. It's the same. It doesn't change. Hmm. But the variance in your actual outcomes fluctu fluctuates wildly. So understanding this, the power of diversification really should impact your investing strategy. Um, just to give you an example, even, even venture capital firms typically are way under diversified. Hmm. They invest in maybe 10 a year for three years in a fund, so that's 30. Mm -hmm. And um, the math shows that uh, there's a you know not insignificant chance that they don't return the fund. Maybe 20% maybe chance they don't return the fund, meaning they lose money for their limited partner investors, even though the average is fairly high still. Okay, um, so I already alluded to this. Uh, the earlier you go, the higher the risk, the mm -hmm. more you use diversify, but the returns, if you can get to that long run, mm -hmm. statistical long run, are very, very high over the last 35 years or so if you'd invested in every deal that gotten a professional lead investor, mm -hmm. so um, uh, angel uh, or, or VC at the seed stage, you would have uh, re returned annualized gross of about 31% annualized, 31% IRR. Wow. That's triple, over triple what the stock markets returned yep. over the same period is like 9%. Like 9%. Wow. Uh, so now contrast this with, uh, you have to understand that there's a difference between the, like the earliest, earliest stages of venture and the later stages. Mm -hmm. A traditional VC firm will invest early, invest middle, invest late. They'll invest all the way. And they're looking actually for um, lower, they're looking for the, the, the time and the investment life cycle of a comp startup where the risk is a lot lower. And they're looking to get most of their capital committed mm -hmm. at like the series B stage where the risk is significantly lower, but it turns out the returns are lower. So if you look at this, if I were to add the, uh, the late stage returns, this is actually a little bit, um, a little bit misleading. Uh, I think these this should be up to like 16% gross. So I mm. think I, I think I uh, I messed up this graph. So it's not quite as bad for the VCs as I'm showing here, um, but it's about half of what you can make if you were just to stick to early stage seed stage investing and not do any follow on. Mm -hmm. It's kind of counterintuitive. All the institutions they look to do follow on, but it turns out you're actually better off if you can withstand the diversification requirements mm -hmm. uh, to continue to invest early. That's where your best returns are. If you want to be quantitative about it. All right. So playing the same game that everybody else is never a good strategy in the markets. <laughs> um, you want to you wanna look for opportunities to change the game. So um, if you think about what I've just talked about in terms of risk and uh, risk and reward and diversification uh, and sticking to this to the early stage to the seed stage a strategy emerges um, 
which says, roughly speaking, within a universe of qualified companies, mm -hmm. nobody can really pick the winners from mm -hmm. the losers, as it turns out, not even the professionals. You look at, you know, you ask a, uh, a VC or an angel uh, who invests in, you know, not an insignificant, insignificant number of companies per year, mm -hmm. say, okay, at this stage, when you just invested, can you tell me which of these companies actually got a better likelihood <laughs> to actually return capital or to return a lot of capital, which is the best investment in your portfolio? Turns out nobody can do it. All the numbers show that people think they can do it. It's cognitive bias. We know about that. Um, and, uh, and you're better off going with the, the null hypothesis, which is I can't predict it, you can't predict it, nobody can, can predict it. Mm -hmm. um, don't let that affect your decision-making process. So if you know all this and you have the capital uh, and you have a, a set of qualified deals that you think, hmm, you know, they could, they, you know, I vetted them, they've been vetted, uh, the terms are validated, mm -hmm. you should invest in all of them, right? So taking a portfolio theory approach, more quantitative approach to investing, uh, you should be investing in all the ones that, that, that qualify according to your criteria or your investment thesis. So mm. I knew this, I still didn't follow it, and this was <laughs> a much bigger mistake. So this is a pitch contest. Um, there are five companies in the pitch contest. All of them are out of business, except for one. Let's see if you can spot my mistake. Skip to the end. Okay, so if I had just invested in all these companies instead of just the winner. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, so uh, that I call that, that, that's about a hundred million dollar mistake. Um, it's okay. I can sleep well at night. I'm a quant. It's okay. No problem. Um, all right, so changing the game. We talked about it. Instead of looking to get lucky and invest in a, uh, uh, a unicorn, or in this mm -hmm. case, a decacorn, 2,000 times. Decacorn, so Facebook invested C stage of Facebook, Google, Airbnb, Uber. Mm -hmm. It's about a 2,000 times return of your money if you invest in the C stage. Wow. <laughs> However, if instead I could take the next 30 years, instead of trying to pick out those, I mean, I've had two of these, right, mm -hmm. uh, in the last... 15 years, wow. and, and they're right in front of me, and I still failed to, to capture them. Um, what if instead I could invest at a 31% IRR, mm. right? If I could invest in a diversified portfolio, uh, and it got 31% annualized, at the end of 30 years, um, I would have 3,300 times my money. It's better than investing, getting lucky, and investing in the next one. So just think about that. And, and by the way, with near certainty, Right. If I'm investing in, you know, at least 300 companies per year for 30 years, wow. the variance goes down. The expected return, expected value, if you're a stats geek, is the same. The variance of volatility goes down, and uh, due to a lot of large numbers. So something to think about. Change the game. All right. How are we doing on time? 1:30. Good. We're good. Zooming through. I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna tell you these, how these principles apply to poker, making you a better poker player. Uh, don't worry about the fact if you don't know anything about poker, you're still going to pick up something that will make you, you know, uh, better than 90% of the people you meet at the table. <laughs> I'll tell you which, which ones of these tips <laughs> uh, will do it um, in a second. But uh, the more you know about poker, of course, the more you're going to get out of it. Um, so money back guarantee for this uh, webinar, they paid like $10,000. But money back guarantee... <laughs> You'll get a complete if you, refund of if you don't, yeah, If you don't improve your game, <laughs> you'll get all your money back for this. Okay. So here's a famous poker aphorism that I like. Look around the table, uh, uh, and you can't spot the sucker. Guess what? You're it. So I'm going to teach you how to not become a sucker or be a sucker at the poker table or be a less of one at the poker table. That's the case when I see. Case may be. Decisions versus outcomes. Here's the law of large numbers in action. Um, the more good decisions you make, the more your actual outcomes will match your expected outcomes in the long run. Um, as we saw, the statistical long run in venture investing is much longer than you would think. You can get fooled by randomness. Mm -hmm. um, same thing in poker. People expect you know, to play, play good. It's, it's actually a term of art. You don't play well in poker, you play good. 
So good is grammatically correct. Uh, if you play good, you should be a winner at the end of the night. Well, it turns out that that's not true. You need about 2,000 hours, 50,000 hands, or 50 tournaments in order for the long run to be achieved. So you can go for months, if not a year, and be a great player and still end up financially losing. Your expected value is high, but wow. Yeah. So the goal is <coughs> to make good decisions regardless of outcomes and let the law of large numbers take care of the outcomes. So uh, I'm going to show you what the math is around poker decision making. And poker decision making is not all math, but unless you know the math, you're at a big disadvantage or a sucker. In three minutes and 30 seconds, I'm going to teach you all the math you need to know in order to become a world champion poker player, I guarantee you. All right? This is what these people are doing at the poker table, at the final table. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Is that playing or no? Oops. There we go. Yep. That's fine. All right. So you, you can hear this. I, I assume everybody at home can. If you can't, put a chat, bot, chat message. So counting the outs. No, you can't hear it. So you didn't hear the previous one. Can't hear anything. Mm. Okay. You know what? Then we're gonna we're gonna skip the video part. And what I'll do is I'll make available this presentation to people. Absolutely. Afterwards. How's okay. that? You Deal. Can go through it. All right. <clears throat> I'm gonna skip the video part. It's fun. It's exciting. Um, it's actually quite good. Okay. Oops. Yeah. All right. All right, you know the math. Doesn't really matter because aggression trumps everything in No Limit Texas Hold'em. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's one form of poker, but in general, aggression is rewarded in poker. It's number one skill for sure in No Limit Hold'em, um, and it turns losers into winners, and it turns small winners into big winners. And here's my tip: very practical tip. I don't care what you have. If you eliminate checking and calling, meaning playing passively from your vocabulary, you never check or call, and you only fold or raise, you'll be better than 90% of the players out there. I don't care what table you sit down. Wow. Everybody plays too, uh, too passively. Um, and they make the mistake of not being aggressive enough. You'd rather win a small pot than lose a big one and be eliminated from a tournament, for instance. Mm -hmm. So selective aggression, what's selective aggression? It means be selective, you can fold, mm -hmm. You should be folding, you know, more often than not. Hmm. But when you do play, raise and re-raise and go all in. Right? The reason is optionality. Okay, back to optionality. So you raise um, when you might have the best hand. This is one of the ways that you can achieve optionality. Mm -hmm. When you might have the best hand. Now you don't have to know about poker. I'm just going to illustrate it with an example here, but I narrate it. Narrate it. And the way, the reason why this works is when you're aggressive, you have two ways to win. Right? If you're passive, you have one way to win. You have to have the best hand at the showdown. Mm -hmm. When you're aggressive, you have another way to win. You know what that is, Jonathan? Mm -mm. You can get the best hand to fold. You can get all the better hands. You might have the worst hand. Mm -hmm. And if you get everybody to fold with a big aggressive bet, you have just created huge expected value, huge alpha, as they say in the investment world, huge edge, right? And so uh, just for example, let's say you have a 50-50 chance of having the best hand of the river, but you also have a 50-50 chance of getting your opponents to fold with your big bet. Mm -hmm. The combined probability is what? Anybody? 75%, wow. right? So in the 50%, you win, right, you win with the best hand, 50%, you don't have the best hand, uh, but you get the others to fold, 50% of 50% is another 25%, 25% plus the original 50%, 75%. Where are you going to find a 75% edge? Wow. Not in poker, typically. So you create it by creating optionality for yourself, being aggressive, creating two ways to win. Um, here's a practical example of it for those who, who I, you know, a lot of people have played poker or watch it on TV. So you have 10-9, the board is an ace-9, 6-4-2. You have... A mediocre hand, you have a second pair, you don't have a great kicker card. In brackets, I'm showing you your opponent, you have some idea what they have based on the betting prior, you've eliminated certain hands that they could have, they might have a six, 
a pair of sixes, for instance, mm -hmm. a pair of fours. You'd be beating them. They might have a pair of nines with a better kicker. They'd be beating you. They have an ace queen. They're really beating you. But if you raise, you might get that jack nine or that ace queen to actually fold because they have to be worried that you have an even mm. bigger hand. So raise when you might have the best hand. Be aggressive. Raise when you might make the best hand at the river, mm. right? So example, similar example, you have uh, uh, you have a, a straight draw, seven, eight, nine, ten. So you need a jack or a six, and and the math video will show you exactly how to calculate the probabilities of that. Uh, turns out it's thirty-two hmm. percent. Uh, so you don't have the best hand, but if you raise here, you might get the best hand to fold, or you might make the best hand in the river. So it's called a semi bluff in poker. I call it optionality. All right, last mover advantage. We'll get to first mover advantage. Last mover advantage is, is more important in, in, in poker. Later movers remember. Later movers remember have more info and let competitors make mistakes. So what you're seeing here is independent of the cards you have. If you are in the best position, the top position here, it's called being on the button, versus the worst position, which is the five percent, the first person to act without having any information about what the other players are going to do, you should be uh, in, the, in the better position on the button, you should be playing 20 times more hands than you should um, in, in, in the first position. This is if you're the first to voluntarily enter the pot. I won't go into the nuances. What I want you to understand is the power of position. Hmm. Okay? And you're, of course, you're going to be playing it for a raise, not a call. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, Last mover advantage is really important, um, and this chart illustrates how important. All right, so dominating a niche, there's a video, you'll watch that later. Um, first mover advantage. All right, so this is a little bit technical and a little bit paradoxical, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk you through it, and it just shows you um, the power of this first mover advantage, right? We know that last mover has an advantage because mm -hmm. you get to see what the opponent does. But if you're being aggressive and you move first, you actually can um, uh, you can actually chip the odds in your favor, right? So ace king versus a pair, a pair versus an ace king before the flop is a 55% favorite. <coughs> in fact, this is true of any two over cards. You have a pair and any two over cards. The pair is a 55% to 45% favorite in the hand, okay? Now, if you know that um, this player who goes all in in front of you and, you're in, you're, and you have this ace king, if you, if you suspect or, you know, strongly or know they have a pair, is mathematically correct to fold. There's no advantage. They're already all in. They've moved first. They're already all in. Mathematically, it's correct thing to fold. There's no, nothing you can do once they've gone all in to change the odds. 55%, you know, you're, you're, you're bucking the odds. However, the situation is reversed. It's also mathematically correct to go all in with that ace-king hmm. and mathematically correct to fold almost any pair, except for maybe aces or kings, maybe, but maybe not kings. Aces are the only hand huh. that you're mathematically correct for sure to call an all-in bet. First mover advantage is so, being all in, first mover advantage is so powerful, you actually transmuted the odds. Wow. Right? By about 10% here. Hmm. So um, I'll let you do the, the, the quantum math as a thought exercise mm -hmm. and do some statistical research, but uh, this, is, this is just <laughs> the, the, the surprising truth. Um, first mover advantage is very powerful as well. Um, hacking your emotions. All right. So here's the thing. You're going to take a lot of bad beats. I mean, you have an advantage, okay? 55%, you get your pair versus two over cards. You're 55% to win. That's a pretty good edge in poker, <coughs> as it turns out. <coughs> and 45% of the time, your opponent is going to beat you. That's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of times you're going to get all the money in and lose either be out of the tournament or lose all your money. So you got to be able to stand that, right? You have to diversify your, your portfolio. But what you can do emotionally about that 
is really uh, of paramount importance because it's not the last thing you're going to play. You presumably can play thousands and thousands more before your poker career is over. So start learning to love bad beats. Start learning to love getting it in, getting all your money in with, a, with an edge and having the sucker make a bad decision <laughs> and it's called sucking out, suck out on you because what you know is you've just banked expected value. That's like money in the bank. If you're in it for the long run and you're not just a dilettante, and you're not fooling yourself about the odds, every time you go in with the edge and you get beat, you know you have a customer, a sucker for life, <laughs> who's gonna continue to pay off over and over again. And in the long run, if you saw that large, large numbers graph, uh, uh, reality will converge with theory hmm. and you will, you'll be a big winner. Another trick I like to use, hacking your emotions, after losing a pot, imagine you won the pot, hmm. okay? These are independent trials. The cards and the chips have no idea what happened the previous hand, so why should you care, right? Reset every single hand, the odds are the same, a priori odds are the same, chips don't know where they came from. Instead of losing half my stack, imagine that I had a quarter of what I had and now I've doubled up. I was the one who won the hand. So that mindset shift mm -hmm. is really powerful because look, you're gonna to have to go right back in, and if you are on what's called uh, on tilt, mm -hmm. right, being emotional, uh, you're not gonna be able to operate um, with rationality and make good decisions. Mm -hmm. you'll, you'll chase bad decision, good decisions with bad decisions. Um, all right, so, um, you're not gonna see this video, but what it is is it's about, um, it's about pulling the trigger, okay? It turns out that there are people who play, in theory, mm -hmm. in simulation, fantastic poker. But when it's real money on the line, uh, they know what the right move is. They can tell you. You can analyze it all day long. And you, you, those of you who are, you know have have pulled the, the trigger on a on a big investment or started a company, jumped in, right, putting everything on the line, you know that that's what separates. Uh, sometimes good business people from world champions, right? People who change the world, people who create unicorns, people who invest in unicorns. Hmm. Playing trigger is so important. So um, there's a lot of folks who, uh, who are fantastic players, but to be world-class at anything, you gotta be able to pull the trigger on your decisions, and you gotta be able to do it like that, right? You, no hesitation, okay? All the analysis goes in ahead of time, mm -hmm. years of practice, but at the end of the day, um, a split second hesitation, either you lose the deal, you didn't get into the deal, um, or in, in this case, maybe your opponent, poker, your opponent can pick up a tell mm. and, and figure out that you're bluffing and call, right? So pull the trigger, very important. Um, all right, changing the game. So the most important decision you make in poker is what table to sit at. So for instance, if you were sitting, if you were the tenth best poker player on the planet, mm -hmm. and you sit at a table with the other nine, what do you think is going to happen? <laughs> <laughs> right? Bad decision. Mm -hmm. Bad decision. Um, so table selection is important, um, and uh, uh, you know that that goes not only for who you're who you're sitting down with, um, but also the games that play to your strengths. You might be a fantastic Nolan Hold'em player, but you couldn't play Limit Hold'em to save your life. Hmm. The same things that make you a great No Limit Hold'em player are your biggest weaknesses, perhaps, in Limit Hold'em, for instance. Hmm. So there's a lot of different uh, types of games. So figure out where you're a favorite, what table you're a favorite, what game you're a favorite. And if you're not, change the game. Hmm. Other ways you can uh, change the game is you can become the house, right? So that. Uh, the house uh, doesn't actually sit and play in poker, um, but actually uh, charges rent. Um, mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, and then you can actually change the rules of the game. You can turn win lose into win win, for instance. Um, and uh, in the, two, the 2003 World Series of Poker, a friend of mine were playing, and we were in the midst of a challenge where we were looking to raise $100,000 for for cancer, for Brent Cancer Foundation, a charity that we had uh, pledged to. 
and we were actually not doing very well in our challenge because we're raising it one or two dollars at a time and we we're setting up events and um, and so we came up with this idea that well, what if we ask poker players who are playing in this event to pledge just one percent of their winnings all right mm. if they lose money they don't know anything because one percent of zero is still zero if they win the main event like Chris Moneymaker did mm -hmm. And you know, made off the two point five million dollars. That one percent turns into a twenty five thousand dollar donation overnight. And there's leverage there. So, this is just an example: uh, pledging a portion of mm -hmm. your investment profits, for instance, or your or your winnings. One example of changing the, uh, a win lose situation because poker is a zero sum game mm. into a win win. Mm. Um, that's an example. Um, so there's lots of different ways, and business models are, are you know start a business models. Uh, are really, uh, it's an interesting and fertile ground mm. for changing scarcity economics, win-lose economics, zero-sum economics into abundant win-win uh, economics. So something to think about there. Um, and if you look at the companies that are really becoming unicorns these days, they're, they're really in the sharing economy where shared value is created as a win-win situation. Entrepreneurship in general, I would say, is win-win. And uh, so for me, like if I had to choose which game to play, for sure it'd be entrepreneurship investing. Mm. But I think poker has a lot to offer. Hopefully I've, in terms of giving you ways to think about, mm -hmm. um, not only poker, but, but entrepreneurship and investing. Um, and hopefully you'll agree with that. Um, so, but there it is. Happy to answer questions as well. No, that was fantastic, Rafe. And the, um, if you guys actually have questions, go ahead and put them into the chat. Um, I like the part that you talked about saying hacking your emotions. Um, mm -hmm. Like, if you're going to invest in startups, you kind of have to get around this idea that I'm going to make 24 quote unquote bad bets and I'll make one really good bet. Mm -hmm. um, or it's just this weird thing where the good outweighs, you know, 10 of the bad or five mm. of the bad. Yeah. What are other ways, you said, imagine that on each one of those that you had lost, mm -hmm. imagine <laughs> that you win the game or that you won because the cards don't matter. What are other ways that you've actually either done yourself or seen um, kind of working through that emotional process of, of yeah. making those investments dealing with some of the disappointment, some of the upset yeah. feelings, anger, that sort of stuff. Yeah. As an investor, um, there are different motivations for investing, right? Um, it's not just a financial decision. Um, presumably, you're picking, if you're, if, you're, if you're choosing and getting to know founders, you believe in their mission, you believe in their business model, you believe in the founders, hopefully, first and foremost, because mm -hmm. all the research says that you can't pick winning ideas or business models or even companies at the early stages, uh, but you can pick winning founders, founding teams. Mm. Um, and so, uh, I mean, your question was was a, really around how do you deal with the emotional ups and downs. I think, for me anyway, I'll speak personally, mm -hmm. um, as an entrepreneur myself, mm -hmm. and having been in the trenches and has also been an investor, I definitely have an emotional connection or resonance to what the founders are going through and how important it is not only in their lives but their team members lives and their mm -hmm. customers lives um, and so if I can uh, you know feel good about hey we we got our money in good right you know we, we the investors got their money in good the founders got their money in good um, we had a good run at it mm -hmm. and uh, certainly not all is lost mm -hmm. right? Uh, one of the things that happens when a startup fails is that the founders mm -hmm. and the founding team are much more experienced. They use that mm -hmm. um, experience to go on to perhaps other startups or whatever it is that they're doing. Um, and you know, while, while it's probably true that eight out of ten startups are, are are successful, probably ten out of ten founders are successful eventually if they just continue at it mm -hmm. long enough. Um, so I feel personally good about not only the whatever it is the mission of the company. I'm personally a, an investor in companies that are making an impact, not mm -hmm. just a profit. Um, so 
for-profit social enterprise, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, I'm going to talk about that as well. But I also uh, feel good about having, um, you know, supported a dream, helped uh, a founder mature, helped, mm -hmm. uh, you know, people uh, have a living, make a living, and something that they're excited about, it's purposeful in their lives for a period of time, for as long as that startup is is alive. So um, those are some of the ways that I think about it. Personally. So it's a, for you, it sounds like it's really about the relationships, the knowing that you trained a team of entrepreneurs, and then the mission and vision, and you just believe that entrepreneurship is a moral good. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. And it's a it's an economic and a financial good for the world. I mean, yeah. if you look at back at the numbers that I, that I share with you, uh, here's the reality: companies under 20 employees in the United States, anyway, and I probably even I don't know what the numbers are. The rest of the world, probably similar. Um, half the GDP are from companies under 20 people. Wow. Three quarters of the new jobs from those same companies. Mm -hmm. um, Large companies are actually net losers of jobs because they're based on efficiency and marginal returns. So the better mm -hmm. off that they do, the fewer jobs they create. They need to automate. So, um, yeah. So uh, I think that I think economically, I think financially, it's it's a uh, it's a good as well to invest. I I look at investing as a team sport. Mm -hmm. Not like I'm just, you know, throwing money over, over the other side of the table and say, "Hey, come back when you tripled it or turned into a unicorn." Like <laughs> I hopefully add value, yeah, um, in in one or more ways, um, and at the very least, I get value out of the relationship uh, with entrepreneurs. And so for me, it's there's no lose mm -hmm. really to investing in, in startups and startup founders. Wow, that's fantastic. Um, user X says, this is a great presentation. I'm looking forward to seeing it again with the video. Sorry, folks. Um, in what ways would you say that entrepreneurship is not like poker so that we actually have that perspective as well? Hmm. Well, what I said before is, is the main one, which is it's uh, entrepreneurship is win-win economics, mm -hmm. right? We create shared value, mm -hmm. entrepreneurship and investing. Um, Poker is absolutely zero sum, mm -hmm. and in fact, when you consider the, the house, it's negative sum. All the all the all of the players, if you're equally skilled in the long run, uh, you're playing poker at a table in a casino. Mm -hmm. All the players will lose money, and the house will win money mm -hmm. um, because the skill will offset each other, and so it's a negative sum game, positive sum game, entrepreneurship and investing. That's the main. You know mm -hmm. the main difference in terms of game theory. Interesting. Um, Marcelo asks. You mentioned that about optionality and the multiple ways mm -hmm. to win. Can you give some insight about which you prefer? Stock options, mm -hmm. preferred equity, convertible notes. Any advice depending on the traction of the venture. So, at what point would you actually exercise? At what point would you buy options? At what point would you just say, "Yes, I'm in. I'm raising." Mm -hmm. um, and when do you go all in in a startup? Right. Or so from is, yeah, is so there something like that? I, I think there's depending on lots of different factors. Mm -hmm. I mean, these instruments have evolved and um, you know exist for a reason. Mm -hmm. um, convertible notes. I'll just do the easy one first. Mm -hmm. Convertible notes came about as a proxy for equity. Meaning mm -hmm. people wanted to get an equity. Equity is the, the most value aligned, mm -hmm. right? That's why it's called equity. The most value mm -hmm. aligned between investor and investee. Mm -hmm. So um, you, you absolutely want to align as much as possible economic incent incentives. So uh, I would say that, you know, actually preferred equity is not as value aligned as common yep. stock. I know you guys, Hack the Founders, uh, really lean into common stock as, mm -hmm. as the best way to. Um, uh, to, to align value, and, and it's, in, it's, it's true, right? It's just, uh, it makes sense. Uh, it makes economics, uh, it make, makes economic sense. Um, preferred equity, okay, um, if that's what investors require, um, uh, great. Um, it, it's good if you can get it, 
as a um, as an investor, but you have to be conscious of the fact that it might create a conflict of interest between you and the founders mm. um, who are responsible for creating your returns later. So you have to be conscious of what happens later mm-hmm. as a company matures. You might actually be killing the golden goose. Mm. Um, I think options are really uh, so convertible notes. Sorry to get up. Off the tangent, convertible notes were a proxy for equity. They have optionality to convert. Mm-hmm. Um, they uh, they allow uh, primarily. Originally, they're used for primarily is to not have to set a valuation mm. for the stock, which nobody knows what the valuation. It's kind of like market price is the valuation. So instead of negotiating for months and months and months, let's just say kick the valuation question down the road until. Things are more clear. More, you know, we have a professional VC who sets the, you know, sets the valuation, mm-hmm. and we'll just take a discount off of that. We'll use that as our. our so it's a good reason. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh, originally it was convertible debt, and mm-hmm. then uh, Y Combinator came along with the safe note, and you know, this convert this idea of convertible equity. I like convertible equity better. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's just more value alignment. Uh, debt. Uh, Unfortunately, it, uh, typically is secured. So, mm-hmm. if the company runs into trouble, now the investors hold that note. They also, if if the conversion triggers are not complete, mm-hmm. meaning there's, you know, there's edge cases where uh, the company could do fantastic and the founders of with common shares can do great, but then your investors who took a lot of risk early on get their four mm-hmm. percent uh, return. Annualized, I've had that happen to me. Wow! I thought I was investing, you know, in equity, and it turns out that the conversion rights weren't exactly what I thought, and the company exited, and I got, you know, uh, I think it was like one and a half times my money, and it should have been equity, and should have been like ten times my money, something like that. Wow! So, so again, you got to be, you got to really think about the value alignment. So, but um, to get a deal done, like convertibles are great. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, it's important to have a, uh, a valuation cap. It really is important. The valuation cap has become mm-hmm. the de facto, or it's sort of like the de facto <laughs> valuation. So it, it, but it's important to have that cap uh, again because it, incentives can become misaligned, mm-hmm. right? The once you've invested um, and there's no cap, and I've done it both ways. Mm-hmm. But once you invest and there's no cap. It was taking a long time for that triggering event. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's uh, it's to the founders' advantage to have the valuation as high as possible, mm-hmm. dilute the investors as much as possible, mm-hmm. um, and it's for the investors' advantage to get that round done quickly so they can convert. So, un- uncapped notes are, are dangerous, I think. Um, and. Uh, so if you can do equity, I would say equity. Yeah. Um, and then uh, options are fantastic too. Um, it, they don't necessarily get the capital in the door as an investor. So they're they're a good way to um, give investors uh, a sweetener mm-hmm. on a deal for taking risk early on, giving them stock options either as an advisor or giving them warrants in the company ability to buy current value stock at a later price, mm-hmm. fair market value. Um, so I think those are, are good instruments, but anything to do with equity is, is, is typically preferred. Awesome. That's fantastic. Um, well, I want to be sensitive to time. Um, we're at 201, so we've been going for about 54 minutes, but Rafe, thank you very, very much. My absolute pleasure. We will email the presentation out along with a link to the video if any of you guys actually want to watch. Um, it's actually pretty exciting, and I don't want to spoil it for you, but, um, you got to watch it. So yeah, it has a story. It flows. Absolutely. Yeah. So, Rafe, thank you very much. Thank you. Cheers, folks. And see.